Okay, so thank, first of all, thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you for writing this wonderful book. Um, I got it, I got the Kindle version the night it came out and I literally was up all night reading it. And then I went to the bookstore and got the, uh, right the paper version just so I could hold it up because it's hard to hold up the Kindle version. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, I just want to say thank you as a Canadian <laughs> right. because uh, and as a graduate of the University of Toronto and uh, as someone who works in, in AI. I, I, um, my first question is a, a lot of these folks and a lot of these stories, I think folks on the team know many of the people and know some of the stories, some will be surprising, but why was it an important story for you to tell? Um, and you know, were there kind of standout moments or standout kind of anecdotes that led you to spend presumably months writing it? Well, it, it's interesting how, how the book kind of uh, changed uh, over the months and years that I was working on it. I originally pitched the book to my publisher after coming back from Korea and uh, and seeing what happened with AlphaGo, right? The, the Go plane machine that DeepMind built. Uh, what I often say is that it was, it was one of the most amazing weeks of my life and I wasn't even a participant in everything. I was just an observer. And it was amazing to see an entire country, um, let alone you know, larger parts of Asia, focused on this event and you could kind of feel the mood of the country ebb and flow with the match itself um right it really tapped into something human uh that that event um and i got to know uh for the first time Demis Asabas um and some of the others at DeepMind David Silver you know who has a Canadian connection um and um you know, as I got to know them, I started to see a book. But I tell you, the book really crystallized when I when I got to Toronto and I got to know Jeff Hinton. Um, that that to me is really the core of the story. You know, Demis is an important character as well. But um, you know, if you've read the book, Hinton is the most important, and he is this this thread all the way through the book um, because he was a thread you know, across the decades when it comes to this basically one idea, a neural network, um, and, and it's um, kind of, you know, triumphs and, um, and, and disasters and, and hype cycles, you know, over the decades. And Jeff, as I, as I researched the book, he was always there at every turn. And it was amazing, not only his influence on the technology and that idea, but how he influenced other people um, and how you, you know, there were connections even to Demis in, in the, back in the UK, let alone all the researchers uh, that worked with Jeff uh, in Toronto and other places. Um, you could just see the story fanning out as I researched it. Um, uh, it really had to kind of begin and end uh, with him. Plus, he's just, he's just an incredibly fascinating, strange, very, very funny person. Um, and I knew that all that, um, you know, if I could get it onto the page, um, could make the book work. Um, in my darkest moments, I kept saying, if I can just show the reader who this one person is, uh, then the book can succeed. Very cool. My, my next question is about Jeff Hinton. <laughs> um, so at least for me, we started the company in 2015 and it was just in the wake of sort of, of AlexNet and it felt that deep learning was being applied to different domain after domain and it was getting great results every time it was applied to new domain. And there was a sense that we were kind of living in historic times. So my question is uh, how historic do you think these times are? And you think people a hundred years from now will be talking about Jeff Hinton and like in the way maybe we talk about Edison or or Einstein or 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 will he have been forgotten? What do you think? That's a really good question. Um, you know, it's hard when you're living through this moments um to to know the ultimate result, right? But what I will say is that 
um, one, another reason I wrote the book is I wanted to document what is clearly a, a, a sea change in the way technology is built, right? For the first time, we really have these systems that learn their skills, right? We've had machine learning and other forms for a long time, but this is you know, learning from data on a large scale. Um, and that has a that has a lot of implications, not only for the tech industry, um, but for society at large, right? The, the systems for the first time are learning things we didn't expect them to learn, for instance. Um, uh, it's changed a lot, um, you know, a lot of the ways the technology uh, industry operates um, when it comes to publishing and its relationship um, to other parts of the world because of that. Um, you know, I do think that it's a real big change that not everyone saw coming, obviously, and that not e everyone recognizes now. Um, uh, I think we will look back on this, uh, you know, in in many ways in the future, you know, as a change. Uh, the question becomes, you know, how far does this go, right? Um, and can we continue to build systems that that learn and in, in this way. Uh, certainly, it's not slowing down at the moment. It's been interesting as I've covered this over the past decade. You know, as the technology would work in one area, there was still enormous skepticism, you know, as, as rightly there should be, you know, in each new area. Um, but then it would continue to show progress. And now we're seeing lots of progress in the natural language area, um, in robotics, um, and we'll continue to see that. Um, but you know, we'll we'll see eventually. You know how far this is gonna gonna go. Um. So the main character in your book is is definitely Jeff Hinton. Um. And there's a lot of. I think one of the reasons it sort of reads like a novel is there's a lot of colorful, interesting characters in the AI space. Um. My favorite, the the, the most colorful for my money is a guy named Jurgen Schmidhuber. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's mentioned a couple times in your book. Do you have any interesting anecdotes about him? Did you have a chance to speak with him or? I, I have, I've, I've spoken with him many times. I first okay. met him in Germany uh, at a conference and he was where he had, uh, he had uh, flown in from Switzerland or driven in from Switzerland. Um, he is, a, he's a striking person in many ways, just the, the way he dresses, right? Uh, with his sort of, he's usually got a driving cap on and, um, you know, I describe in the book as you know wearing these kind of Nehru jackets with no collar. I was at Nips um, in <laughs> Long Beach, you know, a couple of years ago, um, and he's in all black, um, you know, with this, this sort of collarless jacket and and matching pants, pants, and then the driving cap. Um, and he he talks, you know, in in unusual ways as well. Um, you know, many of the people in the book are visionaries. You know, they're looking a little bit into the future. He does that in the extreme. Um, and, um, you know, I love talking to him. Um, but, you know, part of, you know, part of his personality, and this is reflected in the book as well, is that he really feels like he has been wronged. Um, that he, alongside Hinton and others, uh, believed in, in this same idea um, uh, for years. And he feels like, you know, over the past decade, as it started to work, that he didn't get his due. Um, and on some level, that's understandable. On another level, like he does take that, um, he does take that to extremes, right? Um, in his efforts uh, to to win that affection, um, you, know, you you feel for him on some level, right? Um, and and as he struggles to get that recognition, right? That's a human quality, and I think people who work in academia and work in this field you know how this works on some level that you you are sort of always building on the shoulders of other others right and you know there are there are people who are going to get the attention and there are people who are not um and uh, you know when when we're not getting the attention I think all of us on some level wish that we were and when we react to that in different ways though uh, not all of us react the way Jurgen does right right um you know, I, I think part of the bitterness maybe is a lot of the attention was on North America and like sort of Europe was a little bit ignored. So, um, 
Um, yeah. Anyways, it, it make, he makes for a colorful. Uh, he runs to the microphone. He's always the first one at the microphone at uh, at Nips or at Nurps. Um, <laughs> and everyone's kind of a is it like an air of danger, right? When, when he's about right. to <laughs> absolutely, and you hear this from people across the the industry. Um, but you also, you know, you also hear like a, a, a real affection for him. You know, I've talked to a lot of his former students, um, and it's interesting the way that you know th this group is tiny. And whether we're talking about Canada or Europe, there are all these interconnections, um, and, and that became really fascinating to me. That it what really was this tiny group of people who nurtured this idea and then it suddenly started to work um and it was so interesting to see the the clash almost of, of the ideals of these people you know with industry uh and that became a, a big part of the story cool you, you you have a chapter entitled hype in the book um obviously the ai world is extremely frothy and extremely hypey um, do you think technologists have an obligation to represent their work sort of honestly in a non hypey way or what obligation do you think they have? Well, I certainly have that obligation, um, as a journalist. And as I, as I try to do that, you know, in my book or in the pages of the New York times, I get real pushback from a lot of technologists, you know, you know, technologists in Silicon Valley, right? Um, their interest is, you know, is in promoting what they're doing. Um, and I think on some level, I, you know, I really understand, you know, why they do that now, right? They, it's fundamental to the way Silicon Valley works, right? They have to raise money. They have to attract talent. And in order to do that, they have to promote themselves and and they really have to say, you know, this is going to happen sooner than it, than it than it's likely to happen. Right. Um, but, you know, in an ideal world, I, I, you know, I do think that we all have that obligation to really think about what the reality is versus what the hype is. And as much as possible, you know, I do try to push back on that. And I do try to tell technologists that they need to be more careful about this because I think there are there are real dangers to that 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 we've we've seen, um, and I think we all, including the industry, uh, have to slow down and think about, you know, what's really happening so we don't mislead the public, um, but also so that we think about the problems here, um, and and where those problems might be and how we might solve them before it, it, it becomes too late, so to speak. Um, forgive the question about Canada, but uh, the audience is mostly Canadians in the audience. Oh, so, um, oh, the, the, the reason sort of Jeff Hinton found himself at the University of Toronto is sort of some weird accident of history, perhaps. So he's British, he moved to the US, uh, sort of was frustrating that he, he couldn't find funding uh, outside of defense. So he moved, he found a job at the University of Toronto. Uh, and there's sort of a fledgling, well, semi-developed sort of um, AI hub here. Um, and lots of policymakers, lots of people in sort of the, the scene are concerned about the sustainability of sort of AI in Canada. Um, having sort of looked at its recent history, do, do, do you have any thoughts about things we can do here as Canadians? That's interesting. Um, you know, first of all, I will say that, you know, I love that you, I love that you pin, you want to apologize. I love that you pinpoint that story about Hinton. And it's fascinating to me, and that's not the only example that these very personal decisions end up, you know, having huge consequences decades down the road. You're right. You know, he, Jeff and his wife at the time um, did not want to take money from the U.S. military. Right? It was at the height of the Iran Contra affair here in the United States. Um, you know, they didn't want to take money from the military, and particularly from Ronald Reagan's military. So they left. 
Um, and that ends up, you know, having, you know, a real effect on the field and a real effect on where the talent was when these ideas started, started to work. Um, you know, in, in a way, um, you know, I, I like the way that Canada has responded. Um, and there has been added investments, um, you know, in efforts like, like the, the Vector Institute, you know, are, are important. And, you know, and there's still a lot of talent there. And, and, you know, Jeff has gone back to Canada, so to speak. You know, he worked, you know, six months on, six months off in, in Mountain View, California for a while. You know, he's back there. Um, you know, Joshua Bengio never left uh, the University of Montreal and kind of resisted the dollars, um, you know, that were thrown at him. And, uh, you know, I think, you are seeing a, a lot of in investment there, not only from industry, right? Who knows that there's talent there, but also from government and, you know, trying, trying to help, um, you know, keep that going. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard when you're competing with these giant companies um, and, and, and competing in a sense with the U S you know, I had a call like this recently with a lot of, technologists and AI researchers and entrepreneurs in the UK. And, and we talked about, you know, the UK's similar situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I was asked much the same question just about, about Britain. And, and what you do see is you see a lot of talent um, and, and you see even these big companies going to Cambridge and going to London to capitalize on that talent. And that's only going to help, you know, the ecosystem in Canada, uh, as well as as in the UK, um, but what you don't see is the center of gravity really being there, right? Even the UK doesn't have its own tech giant, um, and a lot of people sort of wistfully say, you know, couldn't DeepMind, for instance, have been that tech giant? But you know, the reality is, and I go into this in the book, is that they had to sell themselves to Google. There was no other choice. They just couldn't compete with those dollars. Um, and so, you know, on, on a lot, you know, on a lot of levels, Canada cannot compete with the U.S. But I think what has happened um, has been beneficial, um, and I think that they're responding in the in the right way. Um, speaking of accidents of history, um, I, I, I spoke with with Alex about he had like the first day he meets Jeff Hinton. Um, uh, he's basically either assigned vision or like speech recognition. Right. He's randomly assigned uh, uh, vision, right? Correct. Image detection. <laughs> and he works on the problem and ends up, you know, writing a paper that launches a thousand careers and creates like a billion dollar, trillion dollar industry. Um, it's just crazy that all of these sort of things, there's these, as you said, there's these events that sort of trigger seemingly random events that trigger these crazy things. Um, the, the, the history that you describe is one where there's sort of these uh, tenacious geniuses working in the darkness for decades, um, uh, eventually finding success. Um, do you think there are other sort of things uh, each shrouded in darkness at the moment, uh, waiting, like, what is the next big thing, like, on the horizon? You know, that's, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think that there are just, there are so many holes to fill that there's, there's huge opportunities there. And that's in part the reason, you know, Gary Marcus is a character in the book, right? You know, he, he again is someone who sort of takes his stance to extremes, right? He's intent on telling the world that, you know, the type of machine learning we've been talking about is not enough and that we need other options, you know, you know, uh, it, it's a fair argument to make, but I think the question remains, you know, wh where is that technology? Um, what is it going to be? Um, uh, you know, I think we've yet to exhaust the avenues that we're looking at at here. Um, and I think a lot of people are talking about the, the next thing and the next possibility. Um, and that's what I'm always looking for as a journalist. Um, but in this area, I'm not sure what it is, right? 
Mm -hmm. uh, and if you hear or if you have any ideas, let me know. Right. I, I wonder if maybe the fact that places like Toronto were sort of outside of the limelight, like maybe you had the opportunity for things to mature. Uh, and whereas in a place like, like Northern California, you sort of flit from one hot idea to the next, and you can't devote 20, 30 years to something. Yeah. Um, I have no idea. I would definitely be on it if I knew what the next big thing was. Um, cool. Okay. I, I, I'd like to open it up for some questions from, from the group. Um, if there are any, um, maybe just speak up and. I, I have a number of questions. Um, first of all, thank you, Cade, for, for writing this book because it filled in a lot of gaps for me, even though I'm a deep learning engineer and I've, I've been in this space for several years and, and done a lot of reading. I really enjoyed the stories and the, the kind of the background um, that uh, that you wrote. So, um, okay, so my question is, I, I imagine you've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people in the US government about AI policy. And I wonder, do officials, um, certainly not all officials, but do any officials exist at the highest levels that really understand the stakes involved with the development of AGI, for example. Are there people you've met that have come to grips, that have actually come to grips with the concept, say, of intelligence explosion, or have read Nick Bostrom, for example? Inside the government, the 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 concern and um, the, you know the sort of the the efforts to shape policy are elsewhere, right? There, there's a whole lot of concern over the U.S. government not having the talent, for instance, to build, um, you know, build these types of technologies for the military, right? That is, that's a really big issue to them. And they really understand the technological ideas at play. Um, and they understand, um, you know, the gap between what the what the government is doing and what's going on in industry. That's a very real thing. The AGI thing um, is not something that, that comes up much, and it's seen, um, you know, it's seen as something um, that is not only further out, um, but not not yet worthy of that kind of attention. Um, um, but you know. But we'll see. Uh, I do, you know, on some level, understand that there's so much to think about in terms of the issues, um, you know, geopolitically as well as technologically, um, you know, with with what's going on now uh, versus what's what's going on in the future. I see. I have a follow up question to that, uh, which is, so I hear people like Eric Schmidt making statements to the effect that, you know, the U.S. government needs to get serious about AI investment um, so they maintain their lead. Um, and, you know, also you, you referenced the gap between in, you know, what, what exists in industry and what exists in government. But I hear less about, less, fewer people talking about the fact that the U.S. government probably ought to be trying to collaborate with China in AI research to prevent a global arms race. And I'm wondering if you think there's a possibility for genuine international collaboration so we can avoid the fate of having competing national Manhattan projects racing each other to build this tech. I think it's another another good point to explore, right? The We as humans, we like to think in terms of absolutes, or so many people do, right? That there, there are two sides to an issue, um, you know, that that we as a country, you know, have these absolute rivals. Um, and there's a lot of talk in the U.S. and has been over the past four years, you know, about the competition between the U.S. and China. But, but you're right, at the very least, it's far more complicated than that. And people don't realize, and I've written about this in the Times, that the U.S., for instance, really relies on immigrant researchers in general and Chinese researchers in particular 
so there's a real danger to the U.S. if you you know if you cut off that supply. Um, and there are a lot of Chinese researchers working on government you know projects. Um, and you know on some level you have to think about you know the competition between countries. But but you're right. There's this collaborative aspect as well. And just the way this area works now, where everything is published. Right. It's already collaborative in a lot of ways. And the ideas are available to everyone and everyone's building on uh, on the technology that everyone else is creating. Uh, and and not all policymakers realize that. Right. They still think in terms sort of 1950s terms um, when it comes to you know export controls and immigration controls. Um, and really, we need to think about this in a different way, that this is a global thing. And that's one of the things that's, that fascinates me about the story in the book. And it's one of the reasons I began with that, that anecdote uh, about Jeff Hinton selling his company, right? China is there from the beginning. Right. Uh, people you know, think about them as trailing and, and only competing. You know, they were there very, very early, interested in these ideas. Uh, and that had a real effect. I wish more people thought about it the way that you do, um, uh, you know, and the realities of it. Um, I, I also have a question. Uh, first of all, yeah, it's an honor to, uh, to meet you, Kate. Uh, Kate. Um, my name is Marsal. I, uh, I used to work in uh, speech recognition, machine translation, so I also have a bit of a background in this area when we moved from rule-based systems to, uh, at that time, it was more like HMM, skin Markov models, you know, it's really right. big cursors to uh, deep learning. But actually, my question is more about, um, there's this famous anecdote about Stephen Hawking when he was writing A Brief History of Time. Some, uh, apparently, the, his editor told him, well, every formula that you add to the book, you're going to half your, your sales, right? So um, how did you approach a very technical topic uh, with potentially, you know, complicated mathematical formulas um, for, you know, a more uh, general public. Yeah, that that was really important to me, right? I, and I, I really like that people like you are interested in this book. And I want it to be something, you know, that will interest, you know, the community that you all are a part of, right? I wanted it to work on that level. Uh, but I also want it to be read by everyone. These are big, big questions that are affecting everyone. And I wanted to make sure um, that it would be read outside the field. And hopefully, you know, it it will be. Um, and, you know, the reviews that I'm getting, the, the you know, the, the most excited I get is when it's written by someone who will even admit you know, in the review that they are not a technology person, right? That they are not... Um, someone who normally reads about this stuff, and that they and that they get the book, um, and and that they are affected by it, right? That's, I think that's super super important. But it's it is such a hard thing to do, and it's another reason that um you know that I like Jeff Hinton as a character. You know he he loves to underplay his own skills as a computer scientist and a mathematician. You know and. You know, on some level, like he's not giving himself enough credit, but that it, it's an opportunity um, to, you know, sort of use that character trait uh, to describe this stuff in a way that anyone can understand. And he even takes, you know, a mathematical concept like backpropagation, you know, and I want to convey that to some, on some level to the layperson. So they basically understand what's going on there. And they can understand at a high level um, these changes without actually going into the mathematics of it, right? Uh, there are other books that can do that, but I really want this to be read like a Stephen Hawking book, uh, hopefully. Um, yeah, I had a question uh, about um, kind of competition um, that you kind of mentioned earlier. Um, you mentioned obviously that DeepMind kind of had to eventually uh, sell in order to uh, compete. Uh, you mentioned that you know even Jeff had to eventually sell to Google. Um, it seems like a lot of the, in, in a lot of cases, in order to compete on within the AI field, 
you kind of need to be a big part of a big company. You need access to big compute. You know, OpenAI obviously did that. You know, billion dollar partnership with Microsoft just because they needed more compute. It seems like um, it seems like we're trending more towards kind of these big powers and in, in terms of trying to do uh, significant or um, research in, in this field. Is that kind of the trend that you see? And is that a good thing, or is there ways to maybe um, uh, avoid that? It's absolutely the trend. Uh, and, and you know, if you look at sort of the sweep of the past decade, right, it's all about the data and the processing power and the talent. And those big companies are going to have an advantage when it comes to all three of those, right? That's why that's why Demis, I've talked to both Demis Hassabis and Shane Legg, one of his co-founders, about this, right? They just feel like they had no choice but to sell themselves because the talent had become so valuable. They had a lot of it, but they didn't have the money to hang on to it. If they if they had stayed independent, they would have lost all their researchers. Um, and then it goes without saying that these companies have, you know, have the dollars for the processing power, and and then they have the data, right? Because they run these giant internet services. So, for instance, in the field of natural language understanding, they are going to have a significant advantage there when it comes to these, you know, GPT-3 style language models. Um, it's, it's hard if you're in academia, let alone a small company, you know, to compete there. But, you know, so you, I think you're going to continue to see a gap when it comes to that type of research, right? You, others just can't compete. But the good news is, is that, you know, on some level that ends up trickling down, so to speak, uh, to the rest of the community. You know, computing power, as time goes on, it gets cheaper. And so what seems like a giant model today, uh, you know, is not going to seem as big tomorrow. And it, it's going to be practical for smaller players. Um, but you also see places where smaller players can compete, right, on, on the edges and on particular technologies. Um, I recently wrote a piece about kind of efforts to build basically self-flying drones using many of these same concepts, right? It's, it's startups that are working on that. I mean, they're well-funded, um, but they're not giant companies. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of people are worried about that gap between particularly academia and industry when it comes to this, right? That there needs to be ways um, for academia to compete, so to speak, and where people can do that research um, in places that are not inside these giant companies. Um, I'll ask a quick one while, while you guys are thinking. Um, uh, one thing I think that Jeff Hansen is good at is the analogy or metaphor. So um, we think of these things, they use the word neuron, um, we call them neural networks, but it, it's, it's really just math. So I think if you didn't know what was going on, you, you might think that they were building something out of electronics to like, like make cells in the brain, but it's, it's really, we're just multiplying numbers together. Um, but it, it sort of changes the way uh, you think about the problem. Um, and I think DeepMind does a great job with this um, and the concepts like attention, right? Which is not exactly the same thing as attention in sort of the psychological sense. Um, um, have, you, have you, do you have any thoughts on, on this particular thing? I have a, a lot of thoughts. Like, you know, the biggest one is that, you know, I often say that like the original sin of the founders of the AI field was that they, they called it artificial intelligence, right? That automatically gives you this false sense of what is going on. And it's been like that since they coined the term in the 50s, right? And you see that in the book uh, that, you know, Frank Rosenblatt, you know, who built the Perceptron, he, you know, he talks to the New York Times in these sort of extravagant terms. And the New York Times just, you know, my own paper just repeats all this and it creates this, this false notion of what's going on. And, 
you know, the same thing has happened. You know, we're in the middle of this hype cycle now. Um, it's happened, you know, with deep learning or neural nets. Um, if people even, you know, take the time, you know, I'm not sure people take the time to think about what's really going on there. And because of that, you know, they get this false sense. Um, but, uh, but on another level, I think you're right that, it, you know, Jeff is very aware of that. Um, and it, it helped him push the technology forward. You know, he had to get the attention of people in the field. There's this great moment in the book where uh, Russ Salakutinov, um, you know, he, he runs into Jeff um, in Toronto and at the university, and he's basically left the field, right? It's not what he's working on. But Jeff has rebranded it, right? And, you know, he talks about these deep belief networks, you know, and, and that's what pulled Russ back in, right? These, these types of, I mean, language is important, right? I'm a writer. I certainly believe that. Um, and Jeff knows um, how to use that. And he sees how people respond to that. You know, the other key moment was when he gave this, this speech of what became NeurIPS, right? And he, and he called it deep learning for the first time. And, and he heard how the, his audience responded to that. Um, and, you know, and he used that, um, you know, he, he is, you know, he, he is proud to say that, that he used that and other people talk about how effective um, that can be. Um, but, you know, the other interesting thing is that that is really how Jeff thinks about these systems, right? he sees it as a reflection, however simple, of the brain, right? And that has been a guiding light for him over the decades that, you know, he sees, you know, he sees the brain as something that you look towards uh, when you're building these systems. Um, and, you know, not everyone thinks in that way, right? Alex Krzyzewski does not think in that way at all, right? He sees it just as mathematics. Um, but there are advantages uh, as well as disadvantages to thinking about it um, in those terms. I, I think that that brings up an interesting point, which is, it, do, do you think that it was sort of faith that that is what really pushed this? Like, like I, I think you know, regularly we're we're kind of taught like, oh, you know, you should look for evidence. You should have you know, you should make principled decisions, you know, uh, that, that's a very, it's a very logical sort of way to do things. Uh, but like, here, like, it seems like it was just, it was like faith, it was just like, there's a belief, this can work. Uh, he was, he was able to almost like a, a priest, bring, bring uh, Russ back into the flock, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's, we, sometimes we think of it that way as, as well, like, it's, we're a bit, sort of we're, we're sort of like deep learning zealots in a way like a lot of people will say it's a right. you know like oh you should use the right tool or whatever but we we just kind of have this weird belief that there's so much more to it i i, I don't know like do you do you do you think that's do you think that's true that it was faith that that is what like pushed this idea I, I think it's a I, I think it's real. I think it's a big part of it. And you see it now, you know, with with other forms of technology. We talked about AGI earlier, right? That you know, the people who are, you know, who are, you know, their stated mission is AGI, right? They have that sort of faith in it. But the other thing I will add is that there's a real practical way that Jeff Hinton's faith manifested itself, right? Um there was a, a, a really important interview I did with one of his students. Uh, we were actually at Google headquarters, um, uh, a guy you may know named George Dahl, who's now at Google. And he was instrumental in getting these ideas to work with speech recognition. Um, you know, uh, Stephen, you talked about, you know, Alex sort of being fated to work on on images, you know, George worked on speech, not because he was interested in it, but just because no one else was doing it, right? And he, he just wanted to do something different. So he ends up on speech. But I had this incredible interview with him uh, at Google. And it was incredible uh, because of the way he talked about, the way George talked about Jeff Hinton. 
and what he says, this is in the book, he said, you know, the theme in, in Jeff's lab was old ideas are new. And if, if you had not proven that something would not work, then you kept working on it, right? That, that's the common theme. And Jeff talks about that with back propagation and you know how that came about and that he realized that although he thought there was a proof in place that it wouldn't work, the proof was wrong. It wasn't really a proof, right? And so th there's a real practical way that he talks about and th that, you know, you keep working until you know it's not going to work, right? And that can be hard. Um, Jeff and so many others talk about the fact that they had no idea how much processing power would be needed, right? You know, back in the 80s, they thought, well, if we had a, a if we have a hundred times more processing power, you know, this should work. What they needed was a million times more, right? That they're not in the moment realizing how far it really needs to go. But you know, they they hadn't proven that it wouldn't work, right? And I think that, that that is key. You know, as he can still see runway, that's when he's making efforts to, you know, really not only push push it his own work forward, but but pull people in to what he's doing um, and get them interested. I, I had a, I had a sort of related sort of question, which was, uh, I, I, I haven't gone through the whole book, but I, I got to a part where I think he, Hinton was trying to get an intern into research in motion and they turned they turn the intern down. <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, it, I think we could, I, it's natural to assume that, oh, like research in motion just became complacent. And I, and I do think they, they did, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm certain other huge innovative companies turned down deep learning and turned down uh, Hinton's people, uh, and I, I'm wondering, like, sort of, it, was that, what was, did they just make a mistake, or was it that, like, was it like they, they let their sort of inherent biases, you know, not let them see the value, or was it, was it the right decision given the information that they had at the time? Um, like, they, like, or, or, yeah, like, because I, I think, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, it's like a bet and you can, you know, you can never tell which bet's going to win. And so it's just like, we're not going to make any bet. Or did they make, did they commit some sort of fallacy? Well, what I will say is it, it's so interesting to me um, how all these companies responded in very different ways. And a lot of it is, and this you know, this seems strange to outsiders, but let me tell you, having covered, you know, the tech industry for so long, it's real. These companies like have their own personalities. And as you go on the book, you'll see that like Microsoft, for instance, responds completely differently to the situation than Google or Facebook, right? Um, who like see this working and then they are suddenly like all in and they're buying up people. And, you know, a lot of it is about, you know, seeing what's going on and jumping on it. Some companies just didn't see it, right? Um, you know, RIM, you know, didn't see why this would be interesting. Um, but also, I think that what another thing that gets missed is that some companies had the infrastructure where this could, where there were, where there could be a payoff. Meaning, Jeff Jeff Hinton talks about this in the book. Google had Android. They had a place to put that speech recognition, right? Um, there was a system already in place. Uh, it didn't work very well, just like Siri didn't wasn't that great, but they had a place to put it and then distribute it really across the world. Microsoft didn't have that, right? They didn't have a platform like Android. Um, and so they were they were at a disadvantage. So it wasn't just about their attitude. It was about, they just didn't have the infrastructure to make it happen. Um, RIM came along at the wrong time, right? Their their platform was already, you know, on the wane. Um, you know, if they had jumped on that, would that have made a difference? Um, probably not, you know. But it's so interesting that, you know, RIM turned them down. You know, Jeff eventually goes to Microsoft and, you know, kind of nurtures the technology there. 
um, you know, eventually they go to IBM as well as Google, right? So it's all these companies at the same time, but you know, there was one company where it really popped and that was because it wasn't so much that Google saw what was going on. It was that, you know, it, it had the opportunity to make it happen. Hi, Cade. I have a question. Yes. Um, and also great to meet you. Thanks for chatting with us. Um, so my question is about striking the right balance between being optimistic about AI and scrutinizing its dangers. Right now, the public understanding is wrapped up in so much anxiety, which obviously is warranted to a certain degree. But sometimes it seems like the gloominess surrounding it is just like drowning out an honest look into its potential. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to communicate about it without seeming Pollyanna-ish? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's about, you know, we talked about, you know, hype cycles and the damage that it can do. To me, it's really about pinpointing where the technology is actually working in positive ways, right? So, for instance, the AlphaFold result um, out of DeepMind, that's such an important result and unexpected, right? And, um, you know, that that is worth talking about, right? Um, it's something that all of us can relate to amidst this pandemic, right? If we can have technology, uh, and there's still a lot of question marks over over what they've done, but it, it's it's a big step forward that no one expected, and it could help us potentially deal with the type of pandemic you know we've just lived through right can you can you have technology that can help you develop vaccines quicker or repurpose medicines right so the way i think about it is is you look for those those moments you know um, you look for those technologies um, that are going to help us and you shine a light on that um, right these are it's interesting the way you know these ideas are working in so many different areas and it's also interesting how um you, know, you have these dual use technologies so there there some uses can be good and some not so good and you have bias and all that but it you know the danger is painting everything with the same brush right and um and just talking about it in these very general terms all right let's think about specifics and you know i often talk about with the labs that i cover right you know let's talk about what's really working with gpt3 for instance you know where where can this take us let's let's focus on that uh, and talk about that rather than talk about about it in these sort of grander terms um that's the, the way i think about it uh, as a journalist, as I try to explain it to people, right? It's not about like taking a stance, you know, is this good or is this bad? It's about showing people what's, what's really happening. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So if, if I may do a little, uh, kind of a plug for square, I think one of the cool things about square and the way that we apply technology is that we're very aligned with our customers, right? Our customers are sellers small business owners. And the more the, the, the more they grow and, and obviously process transactions and have employees, the more that we benefit. But it's not that we're trying to sell them a lot of new products or attention. No, we're just trying to uh, make the running of their business easier, right? So I think looking at alignment is, uh, is obviously uh, important. Um, I think you're, you're exactly right. Um, and that's another thing that I look for in covering this stuff. We aware is their alignment, right? There's, there's sort of progress for progress sake, but where do we have situations where, you know, the technology is aligned for what we as a society needs or what a market needs, right? Sometimes that doesn't always line up and it's, it's really important to find those spots. Not only where the technology is working, but where it where it can really help us, um, and you know where we're we're struggling, you know, to make something work. I think that robotics is a really 
good example here. And this gets back to the previous question, right? That, you know, there's over the past 10 years, there's been all this sort of talk about, you know, AI and the robots taking our jobs. But if you look closely at the situation, the reality when it comes to say, you know, self-driving trucks or robots in the warehouse, uh, or now there are these new efforts to build kind of robo taxis as, as, as they call them. In all those markets, there's not enough human labor, right? The, the industries are struggling to keep up. And particularly during the pandemic, it's hard to staff all these warehouses to sort through all the stuff that needs to come into the warehouse and then be shipped out. There's a real need for machines that can help do that, right? Um, so it's not sort of the, the doom and gloom scenario that people think. I mean, the reality is, is that there's a real need for the technology. Hey, uh, Kate. So I, I have a quick question um, around kind of one of the things that I've seen as being the most interesting uh, in the past few years for me, uh, I, I come from a computer science background. I uh, didn't really do any ML stuff before joining up with DESA. Uh, and one of the things that uh, has always stuck out is kind of the, the difference in backgrounds uh, that people have um, and how this contributes to the way that they think about um, the problems that they're facing in within the AI field. Uh, so for example, like, you know, you might have someone with a quantum physics background who has some really unique perspectives or someone with a uh, hardware engineering background who uh, can bring some of their their sites as well. Uh, is there anyone that you've talked to um, that kind of provided you with some of the most unique insights uh, and what would be their background? Uh, just kind of interested in that. Interesting. Um, well, I did, you know, you see this reflected in the characters in the book. They They all do have their own unique backgrounds, right? Jeff, Hinton kind of came at this, you know, as, you know, almost as a psychologist, right? Or, or you know, in, in a way, a neuroscientist thinking about this technology as being built in the image of the brain. But then you have someone like Jan LeCun, you know, he's very much an engineer, you know, trained as an engineer. And, and he brought, um, you know, that sort of attitude uh, to it. Um, I also like you know, they do come from different parts of the world and that can really help um, your perspective as well. And as we sort of struggle with this idea of bias, you know, I think that that is clearly important that you need many, many uh, different uh, points of view. Um, and, you know, this gets back to an earlier question as well. When it comes to these companies responding to the new technology and seeing where it's going, it often took a different, uh, a very different point of view. There's this, you know, one moment that I'm still amazed by in, in the book, there's involving uh, this, this guy named Chi Lu, uh, who was born, born in China, um, uh, grew up in, in Shanghai and outside Shanghai and ended up as a as one of the top executives at Microsoft. And he's one of the few people who, who sees this technological change happen and wants the company really to, to jump on it. Um, and there's this amazing moment where you know, he realizes how stuck Microsoft is in its old ways. Um, and it's sort of, you know, ossifying around this sort of co corporate culture which is not in tune with what is happening. And he's got this incredible, you know, plan to change the way that Microsoft thinks. And what he's going to do is he's going to build this, this backwards bicycle, as it's called. So when you turn the bike left, it goes right. And when you turn it right, it goes left. And so he's got this plan to learn how to ride this bike, which is incredibly difficult. Like it takes weeks or months to learn how to do this. And then you forget how to ride a regular bike, but he's going to do this because it's going to prove to all these Microsoft executives that you can change your way of thinking. 
Um, and I won't give you the punchline if you haven't read it, because the punchline to this story is just too good. Um, but you see this time and again where where you do need different perspectives. And I think all of us you know, understand this on some level and live through it, that we tend to believe um, what you know, everyone around us believes the people who are closest to us, like you see this on social media and you see it in our daily lives, but it does help to get other perspectives in and, and to realize, you know, when, when a change is needed, you know, some people take that, that notion to extremes and sometimes that's a good thing. Kate, I, I was stunned by that scene in your book where I think it was Lee Dang was giving a presentation um, to the AI research group at Microsoft about deep learning and about how it was emerging. And some guy gets up to the front and like rudely interrupts his presentation to inform everyone that deep learning couldn't possibly work because it was disproved by Minsky's book in the 60s. Um, and I just thought that was just so shocking. Well, it's another interesting thing is that and we, we see this in our daily lives as well, right? That ideas get out there and sometimes they just stay out there. Um, and even if they've been disproven or even if there's, there, there's, you know, brand new thinking that contradicts, the, you know, that idea, they linger. Um, you know, it's amazing within companies, out, outside of companies. Um, the other thing I've learned in covering this this space for the times and in writing the book is that if you spent years on something you know you're naturally going to defend it right um and there's this incredible moment also it's also at microsoft and you know we talked about earlier forms of speech recognition and um you know this is a story about sort of earlier forms of natural language understanding but there was this linguist who was working in microsoft research named chris brockett and he he was sitting in uh, on this presentation at Microsoft when uh, basically a couple of research at Microsoft started using statistical methods on translation. And he had spent years like, you know, as a linguist sort of trying to define, um, you know, natural language in English and, you know, rule by rule. He spent, I mean, you know, six or seven years. And then he saw this statistical method which was pretty simple like in a matter of weeks it almost eclipsed what he had spent years doing and he he literally thought he was having a heart attack um and had to be rushed to the hospital right so he could sort of see his whole career evaporating you know so what you see time and again is people you know seeing you know their career in danger or you know, at least feeling that anxiety or at least you're trying so hard to defend their turf just because they've they've invested so much time uh, in it, and you know you see that in academia, you see it in industry, right? That's that's just a human quality, right? You don't want to give up, you know, everything that you've built. Do Do you think that um, Noam Chomsky has criticized machine learning on similar terms? But I, and maybe from a similar angle as Brockett, because he says he's called it essentially butterfly collection. He said that like never in the history of science has success been defined by in the way that it's defined in machine learning, where you don't understand a model at all and you just look at the output. But essentially, like you know, generative grammar has failed where statistical models have succeeded in making translation. Do you think it's a similar thing, or do you think some of his points are actually salient here? Well, I mean, I think it's easy to make those those statements. Um, you know, and there there is a, a change there. Um, but is it necessarily a bad thing? Um, you know, that we can't understand it. There are certainly problems that come if you can't understand the model and it, that it behaves in these unexpected ways, and that um, you know, the machine is doing so much of the work and the human is taken out of it, right? There there's concern there but in the end you know it's interesting to hear to hear Jan LeCun talk about this like he says it doesn't matter like in the end it doesn't matter if we understand it or not what matters is whether it works so it's about the back end of it and showing where it works and was it where it doesn't um 
and getting to the point, you know, where it works the way you want to do. And that's a hard thing to do. Um, but he, you know, he really thinks it sort of misses, misses the point. Um, but, you know, on some level, I think that Chomsky's right. We need to think about this. The fact that we as humans cannot wrap our head around all that data, right? And that means fundamentally we can't, understand everything that's going on uh in one fell swoop like that so we do need to we do need to realize that uh as we build and deploy these technologies and work to test them the way you know jan talks about so we are at time um it's been an hour thank you so much for spending an hour with us this was this was amazing and thank you very much for, for writing this book um, no. I'm sure. yeah Thank you for, for doing it. I enjoyed this. Great questions. Um, uh, it's good to hear them, all right, as I continue to think about all this stuff. And uh, it's much appreciated. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you again. And, Thank uh, you. Have, have a good one. Yeah. Thank you so much.